Welcome to your independent facilitation training for those seeking to serve self-determination program participants. This is provided by the East Bay Independent Facilitation Workgroup, a partnership between the Regional Center of the East Bay Self-Determination Local Advisory Committee and the Bay Area Office of the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. We're glad you joined us for this eight session series. Section seven, health and safety. Your guide for this session is Val Bivona. In this session, we will cover recognizing abuse and prevention of abuse, mandated reporting, emergency preparedness, and crisis services. We wanna talk some about, of course, why these things are important. It means a lot to be able to get out ahead uh, in terms of preventing and things from happening and also to be prepared. Preparedness is truly the key. As someone who's disabled, I am very familiar with the significance of planning. I think it's sort of inbred for people who are disabled. We get very familiar and creative with the need to plan. Uh, on a daily basis. And also preparedness does build confidence and it would be good to keep that in mind when you're, you're working um, with your participants um, and include them in this process as much as you can. As we go along and talking about this today, we'll come back to that which also will include when you uh, document and save plans or outlines, always keep in mind to do this in a format that works well for the person. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about recognizing abuse. Um, most people do not report abuse on their own. I feel that it's sometimes it is hard for individuals to report abuse or to acknowledge that abuse is happening. And I want you to consider that when someone is dependent on another person and that person um, may be abusing them in some way, and we'll talk obviously about different kinds of abuse, it's really hard for that person to be able to uh, acknowledge it and then be able to report it even to another uh, human being. There are different uh, kinds of abuse and which would include financial abuse, uh, using someone's money without permission. On a more subtle level, it would also be using um, people's other personal possessions without um, permission. There's physical abuse, of course, mental abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and then there's neglect. And neglect um, would be not doing something for the person that you know needs to be done. It could even be having the person say, um, remain in bed when uh, they need to get up or they need to get out to do something they wanna do, it may end up to be easier for that person to say, stay in bed that day. So it might be um, sort of convincing the person that they don't really uh, necessarily need to get up and out of bed. So keep in mind that neglect is on the spectrum also of abuse. You wanna know the signs that someone may be experiencing um, when they're experiencing abuse, know the signs to look for. And here we have sudden change in behavior, unusual fear or anger, uh, refusal to communicate as is typical for that person, denial, unexplained depression, a lack of interest in previously enjoyed activities and a change in their eating, sleeping, 
and activity schedule and also acting out in some way, possibly aggressively. I think one of the main um, things that will be helpful in your relationship with the person, of course, the individual you're working with has picked you as an individual facilitator because of trust, because they trust you either because they know you for a really long time or because in making the decision to sort of quote, hire you as a facilitator, they felt that you were someone um, that they could relate to and they could trust. And so as you get to know the person um, and you, more and more, if you if it isn't someone you know, I've known from the past, you will obviously um, see if you see some of these changes it uh, and begin to have a conversation with that person to see if you can bring out maybe the issue that's happening to light. So now we're going to talk a little bit about recognizing and preventing abuse. First, work with the SDB participant to identify different kinds of abuse that exist, as we previously mentioned, and how that might look for a person in their situation. You may pick something like getting change back for the store if we want to talk about some level on fi of financial abuse. And um, maybe someone goes to the store and they're not returning the money that was given uh, the correct change when the person returns from the store. Something that might help you and the individual in terms of preparedness is if they gave the person an envelope with the money in it, clearly uh, went over with the person how much money was in the envelope and wrote on it um, list change receipt. And so when the person comes back from the store, together with the, with the, uh, the provider, the individual would go through, look, make sure the list was there, make sure the change was there, make sure the receipt was there. And I just use that as a simple example of preparedness and prevention. Now, if we're gonna be talking about documenting uh, these plans, you definitely wanna work with the individual on what's going to be best for them. Um, it could be anything from, you know, you can even color code certain uh, pieces of paper or certain parts of the plan, make sure the plans are in a place that's accessible to people. That is very much an individualized thing. And also someone, of course, will tell you what is the best way um, for them to be able to follow these plans, what would be most helpful to them. Now we're going to talk about a little bit about what's called mandated reporting. In California, there's the Welfare Institutions Code. You will have these resources uh, to look through. But just briefly to mention, there are different, there may be different requirements for reporting depending on the kind of abuse and where it occurred. It's very good to familiarize yourself with some of these. Well, with the codes, uh, probably in their entirety. It, does, it may seem like a lot of material, but you can go over it and then, you know, lightly, and then you would know where to look if, if something comes up and you feel uh, that it's necessary for uh, you to report it or communicate with, with someone at the regional center to report it. One of the things covered in terms of uh, codes is confidentiality, which is another welfare and institutions code. And it also, that code also talks about the requirements in terms of confidentiality and the exceptions. There's also uh, what's called HIPAA, which you may have heard of already, which is the Health Information and Privacy Act. And if you go look up HIPAA, you will see um, what's covered under it in terms of your rights, people's rights, 
in terms of coordination of care. So how certain um, private information gets shared between different agencies and services that are uh, providing services to the individual, providing care to the individual. Also HIPAA in terms of employers, in terms of what can be shared, what needs to be shared and not shared uh, with family members, probably dependent on the age of the individual you're working with. And also in terms of what goes in people's medical records. So we wanna talk a little bit about um, crisis services. First, working with your STP participant to identify what a crisis would be for them. It could be a medical crisis, it could be a housing crisis, um, psychological crisis, emotional crisis, and, or it could be a mobility crisis. I know for myself, I'll use the mobility crisis as an example. Um, I use a power wheelchair, so uh, I have to always consider if, the, if what happens if the power wheelchair breaks. I can no longer use a push chair, so my mobility would be totally stopped um, if the chair breaks down. And probably I would end up very stationary or perhaps even in bed. And no one wants that kind of disruption, of course, to their daily activities. So if I, when I think about uh, prevention, part of what I do is to try to keep my chair in as great operating condition as possible, make sure that I have a, um, a good idea about how old the batteries are and look for the indicator to when they're not charging uh, fully any longer. Um, and I do that as much as I can with what uh, other parts of the chair and how it functions. I also try to, which a number of us do, is keep um, the previous wheelchair when we um, get a new power chair every five or six years or how, whenever that happens and keep that running as best as possible and make sure it's operating. People you might also consider knowing uh, what kind of emergency transportation services are around uh, in the area where the person is living, which is hard to come by, but there are of course services that may, would be available to pick up a person if their chair breaks down when they're on the road and bring them home. And that's the kind of plan that you would probably help somebody develop for whatever crisis they might identify as something for them that they're truly concerned about, what to do, who to contact, what immediate steps can be taken. And then to save this plan in a few locations, uh, at home, at work, probably at the re in the regional center file and with yourself as the independent facilitator. Again, to make the plan as user-friendly, uh, develop the plan very in with the individual, have the person take initiative as much as possible to develop parts of, of the plan. Um, if you're developing things like a, an emergency kit, you may want to uh, go to the store, door with the person after you sit down and, and um, they come up with what they, what they might feel needs to be in it. And then you can add your, you know, um, items that you feel of course would be necessary. You may go together with the person to the store or they might go with their provider on their own to pick and choose what goes in the kit. The more proactive the person can be, the more confident they will will feel about um, if and when an emergency arrives. And, it, and in this way, that um, the preparedness also, of course, contributes to prevention. And I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some emergency preparedness tips that you might wanna um, consider and go over with the individual. And hopefully this will be available to you also as a resource. So some things maybe to keep in mind would be, uh, if you lived in an apartment building, you certainly wanna find out where the nearest fire extinguisher is located. You also would wanna work with the person to ideally to make sure they have a fire extinguisher in their home and that it's located in a convenient place that they or their providers can reach it. 
and, to, and that all staff is trained on the use of it. Another uh, tip would be uh, to identify where a circuit breaker panel in or near the person's residence is, and also to show staff how to shut off the electricity, say to the kitchen, which is where most fires might usually start. Think about uh, talking with the person and going down to the fire station to introduce themselves and ask uh, what they should do in case there's uh, an emergency. In this way, the fire, also the fire department would then be familiar with where that person might be located in the community in case of a fire, earthquake, or other disaster. If in fact you do use a power chair, you might wanna find out if they can help, um, if you might be able to go down to the fire station to charge your chair, or um, in terms of going out in the community and finding where certain services are located, it might be good to look up and identify if and where there is an emergency shelter uh, in your neighborhood, in the person's neighborhood. And if there is an emergency shelter in the neighborhood to talk to that person that coordinates that shelter and see what kinds of provisions they've made to serve people who are disabled if an during the time of an emergency. And also of course, in terms of their physical accessibility. People might wanna to talk to the management in their apartment building if they do live in an apartment. And uh, if there's a plan in terms of an emergency about how they may be evacuated. And if their apartment is identified uh, as someone living there with a disability that might need help during this, this kind of a crisis. Simple things like keeping your cell phone charged or buying an extra charging cable for your cell phone. Uh, there are certain devices that are out there. One is called Anchor, A-N-K-E-R, that um, can uh, charge your phone once it's plugged in and itself is, is, is kept uh, plugged in and charged. It can charge your phone really rapidly and keep it charged for probably uh, three or four or more times uh, longer than just a regular phone charge. So just to go back over things, um, we've talked about recognizing abuse and prevention, knowing the signs to look for. Uh, we didn't spend too much time on that, but clearly discussing boundaries and how to set boundaries, personal physical boundaries, social boundaries um, is very important and maybe even to work with that person and doing some role plays around this might be very helpful. And in terms of how uh, someone might respond to various issues of, in terms of violation of boundaries. We talked about mandated reporting and some of the codes to look up and uh, contact information to have and phone numbers. And we talked a lot about emergency preparedness and crisis services, identifying uh, what an emergency looks like to create a document and a plan. Again, that's useful for the person, accessible to the person and in a format that works best for them. And to consider where the plans should be located and who should have access to it. So I hope this was helpful to you today. And um, I wish you um, the best in working with um, the individual that has chosen you to be their individual facilitator. You have a very important uh, role in their life. Uh, and I thank you.